Hello, it's Brian again, and today we are here to talk about the wheel lock ignition system. ongoing part of our discussion of uh, military technology at Jamestown. The wheel lock uh, is uh, going to be your first self-igniting uh, system used on firearms, uh, developed after the match lock sometime in the first half of the 16th century. It provides an alternative to having to carry burning cord around for those who are wielding firearms. Now today we're going to be looking at it on a pistol, but you'll see this used on all sorts of, of uh, firearms at the time, military weapons as well as sporting arms uh, of all sizes, pistols and muskets and everything in between. Now before we actually go to fire the weapon, let's talk about how the system actually works. So what we have, uh, of course, is, is the lock mechanism itself containing amongst other things, a serrated steel wheel from which the wheel lock gets its name. And the mechanism is designed to spin that wheel against the stone, which in this case is actually iron pyrite. Many of you, if you're familiar with later uh, types of black powder weapons, uh, may well be familiar with the use of flint and steel to generate a spark. Uh, but in this case, it's going to be iron pyrite or fool's gold and steel generating a spark. And as you can see, I've got a loose piece of pyrite here, fool's gold there, and our steel striker, uh, and you can see that it generates sparks quite well, just like that flint and steel. Uh, and so this earliest self-igniting system actually using pyrite, uh, the flint being a later innovation. Uh, but in the way this generates a spark, it's much like a uh, kind of a clockwork powered zippo. You've got a mechanism that is going to spin that wheel against that stone. So, if you lose your spanner, if you're operating a wheel lock, you're going to run into some serious difficulty because this mechanism is not going to be easy to operate without this, and in some of them near impossible to operate without this. But if you've got your spanner, which is fitted onto the axle of the wheel there, and to begin the process of loading the weapon, you're going to wind it one full rotation. Now, there's a lot of variation. There's no standardization with any of this technology. So this one is actually more of a three-quarter turn. We've got another one that's only a half turn. There's originals that are more than a full turn. So there's no real standardization there. But you wind it around uh, as far as it will go until it catches itself on the inside there. And then gunpowder would be placed into the pan. The weapon is going to be primed. The pan cover shut. Powder and shot down the barrel. The priming and charging of the barrel is pretty much the same with all of these early firearms. And then the, uh, the, the, the cock there carrying the iron pyrite is brought down in contact with the pan cover so that when the trigger is pulled the mechanism is going to release the tension uh, on the spring to spin the wheel as that begins the pan cover is kicked open so that the stone drops onto the wheel as the wheel continues its circuit grinding against that stone it generates a shower of sparks right there in the middle of the pan to ignite the gunpowder and then of course with the ignition of the priming powder the flash travels through the vent to ignite the main charge uh, and propel the ball. So let's go ahead and break this down so we can look at its internal components. Okay, so we're going to begin disassembly here. Conveniently, the uh, other side of our spanner for operating the mechanism is our turn screw or screwdriver. It's not necessarily standard at the time, but not uncommon either. And we're going to begin by removing the, in this case, three screws that hold the lock plate in place. You can see on the back side of the pistol here also a, uh, basically a clip um, that would allow the pistol to be carried in a belt or further support it inside of a saddle holster uh, or that sort of thing. We'll turn the pistol over and you can see the mechanism already free there by removing the uh, screws. Uh, and you can see the inside of the, uh, of the mechanism is quite a lot going on there. It's, it's a complex piece. It's going to be one of the reasons why while the match lock, or why the wheel lock, excuse me, 
uh, has already been available for quite some time by the time they come here to Jamestown, uh, but they are not tremendously common, not, not super numerous in battlefield weapons. There's just a lot of complexity here, makes them uh, challenging to produce, and for your average soldier, especially challenging to maintain in the field. Um, and of course, by comparison to the matchlock, which uh, would be the, the, the most common system at the time, you can see, again, the, 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 the simplicity of the matchlock versus the complexity of the wheel lock. So, what we've got uh, with the operation of the system, again, you're starting with the spanning of the lock. We wind that up, okay? And with it wound, we can now take a look at all of the component pieces inside. Uh, the spring, a V-shaped spring, has been compressed. There's a short length of what looks almost like a bicycle chain uh, that is attached to the end of the spring that has now been wound around the axle. Uh, and essentially when we release the sear, which is accomplished by pulling the trigger, that will allow the spring uh, well, to do what a spring does, right? Spring. And uh, yank the chain off the axle, causing the axle to spin, which will in turn spin the wheel. At the same time, kicking the cog that is going to knock the pan cover open to allow that stone and wheel to come in contact with each other. A lot happening in a very short span of time there. Uh, and it's a system that works really well when it's working, but with more moving parts, of course, there's more to go wrong, and it is a system which, uh, as it gets dirty, is prone to performance issues that can cause misfire, and, of course, shooting it is going to get it dirty. Uh, so the more times you fire it, especially in combat conditions, the more likely you are to start having those performance issues that can potentially uh, eventually cause a misfire. All right, now we're going to reassemble. You can imagine trying to take any of these component pieces apart in a combat situation would not be ideal since there's quite a lot to put back together there. But keeping the uh, lock mechanism assembled is not going to be terribly complex. And we'll put our three screws back into place. Once we've got them in there, tighten them again with our combination turn screw and spanner. And now our wheel lock is reassembled. So let's go uh, load it up and demonstrate exactly how it works. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and load it up and fire it. And that is going to start with, of course, our handy dandy spanner winding the mechanism. And then we will prime the pan. Now this process, of course, as we mentioned already, very similar across uh, most all of your gunpowder weapons in the time period in that you need a little bit of powder in the pan before then charging the barrel. So we've got our primer in there. We close the pan cover to protect that primer and keep it in place. The charge will then be emptied down the barrel. In this case, in place of shot, we'll just be using our empty cartridge as a wad. And then, of course, everything rammed and compacted. We want it as tight in the breech as possible. And bringing the cock with the pyrite down in contact with the pan cover, the weapon is now ready to fire. So, you can see, works pretty well. It's a near instantaneous reaction. 
And again, two. Reload. Simply span the wheel. And reprime. Shut the pan. Charge. Ram. Bend the cock. And again, ready to go. Okay, well there we have the operation of the wheel lock. Uh, again, these are found; these mechanisms are found on a really wide variety of firearms in the time period. There are extant examples of large caliber military muskets, all sorts of sporting weapons, and a wide variety of cavalry weapons, pistols and carbines and the like, sporting wheel locks at the time. The most common application for a wheel lock on a battlefield situation would certainly be amongst cavalry firearms. Uh, match match lock mechanisms on horseback were never very popular and so the self-sparking mechanisms are, are going to be the most popular amongst the cavalry for quite a long time uh, but we know they are here at Jamestown in what kind of numbers we don't know but archaeologists have found components of wheel locks uh, so we know they're here in Virginia alongside the match locks and early flint locks like snap haunts that likely would have been a bit more numerous that concludes our discussion of the wheel lock mechanism. Thanks for tuning in today. As always, if you liked uh, what you saw here today, please like and subscribe below and check out the Foundation's other social media for additional content.